Hello everyone, this is Tammy Schmoon with the Institute of Child Psychology. I am the co-founder of the Institute and I have with me a dear friend, uh, Kim Payne, who I have worked with through consultation. Uh, he has been a keynote at our conferences and he is my uh, go-to uh, for children's mental health. Uh, he wrote the book Simplicity Parenting, which I mean, changed my life as a parent to be at the time and now as a, as a psychologist um, and a consultant. But I'm actually here, and I will be bugging him for an interview about simplicity parenting, but this was a new book that I had read of, of his, Tanya and I had read, and we've actually consulted with him on this book with uh, something called The Compassionate Response, and Kim's going to address that. So the book we are reviewing today is Being Your Best When Your Kids Are At Their Worst. And I think with everything going on COVID-wise, every parent on the planet is experiencing this and has experienced this over the last several months. So welcome, Kim. Thank you for doing this. Hey, Tammy. Nice <laughs> to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Kim, what was your inspiration behind this book? Now, you, you know, you're well versed in the writing field, the academic field, and the clinical field. What was really, what pushed you to write this particular book? Yeah, you know, one of the things uh, that, I, that I've, I've grown up on a farm with horses, mm -hmm. if there's a problem when you're, when you're out on a horse, it's not the horse, it's the rider. Every <laughs> I'm time. a rider too. Yes, I know. All. <laughs> right? Okay. Every time. It's something. Every. There's not a problem with the dog, it's the problem with the, uh, the person on the other end of the leash, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but going back a, a ways um, in, in more the clinical realm, uh, I was working in a clinic and I was working with domestic abusing fathers and they'd been through every kind of therapeutic approach you could imagine. And mm -hmm. it, it, it had helped, but it, they, they, they were still offending. And so this was court ordered um, and here they were. And there I was as a quite a young, young guy, early, early days in, in my professional life. Mm -hmm. And I realized that something else entirely, something completely different needed to be developed. Um, so I developed this, this approach that used the power of visualization, which I'd learned as um, a sportsman. I'd learned that in my early days with sports psychologists. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was very, um, I, that was very new in those days and I was very caught with that. And then uh, on the, uh, on the other hand, I also, um, realized that these, these, in this case, men, uh, had, were giving way too much space, uh, within their, uh, emotions in their inner being, uh, to what they were doing wrong mm -hmm. for good reason in some ways, but, um, what was going wrong in their life. They had a very negative image of themselves, negative image of their children. And so I realized that uh, the, the, the part of them that was a very successful dad was, I'd ask them that question and they, they couldn't retrieve it. They couldn't really find much that was successful at all. And so um, I started to reverse that process and realized very quickly that those things were out of whack. Um, mm -hmm. That, that one aspect of their parenting was dominating, the, the negative aspect of, of themselves as a parent was dominating over the part that was perfectly fine. And they were becoming triggered. They would get very, very easily triggered. And so the, the being at your best when your kids are at their worst is all about, is began then, um, and it, it was all about trying to help these guys get back in balance. And we, you know, some people call it a meditation, other people call it a prayer. For me, it's a practice because it requires practice. And we would practice, we would practice th this over and over and over. And um, there, was the, a t uh, uh, there was virtually no recidivism. These guys got clear of, the, of that situation in their life, much to my surprise, because I, we were just cutting new ground. I, I really didn't know. All I knew is that a lot of the other therapeutic practices hadn't worked for, well, it had had some impact for them, yeah. but they were still offending. Yeah. Well, this is so much, it seems the resilience to shame like all the shame that comes up for us when we feel like we have shortcomings as a parent or as an individual. And 
I'm, I could be wrong, but is some of your work kind of based on those, that inner child work where that comes up too, of being, being overwhelmed by, you know, what's going on in that moment with the child and when their needs weren't met as well. And then I always think of that, I'm circle of security trained and thinking about childhood wounds, how they, they come and resurface into our dynamics with our kids. Part of the book I covered uh, in a section called, if it's hysterical, it's historical. Oh, that's so beautiful. And, 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 and so there, there is this part where we layer on down to this mm. of, and, 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 and we also look at what are our triggers, what are our emotional triggers, but then my background in somatics and somatic psychology sort of we layer on down even more to what's going on in your body before you're about to lose it before you're about to get into that action reaction thing with your kids um, our body gives us a signal um, one mother once called it she could feel the red mists rising. Oh. I'd, I'd never heard that term before. So I asked her, where do you feel it? And she said, in my chest and my throat. Yes. And I said, do you feel it any earlier than, than when you shout? Because she was quite ashamed of her shouting. And she checked it out, came back and said, yeah, it's, it's probably about three to five seconds. Tell me, I've heard that over and over. Yep. It's certainly under 10 seconds. It's usually that count of three, four, five, three, four, five heartbeats. If we can, in that moment, have a, um, an alternate emotional muscle memory, like sportsmen and women yeah. have got these muscle memories that, that when they're tired, when, they're, when it really, really matters at the end of a game, they don't think about it, they just do it because they've practiced so many times that particular move, whatever it is. And as um, parents, I mean, I, I did a lot of sports in my early life, but parenting just you know, makes everything else pale. Into oh, yeah. Just, it's it's you know, the most intense thing you'll ever experience oh, as being a was. parent emotionally, uh, even physically. Yeah. What, so is Timmy and I represented my country where there'd be tens of thousands of people screaming in the stands. Parenting just puts that to shame. Yeah, no, you know, just pales, yeah. right? So, the, so the, there's this internal emotional muscle memory. And that's what the book is about. It's about training that so that it kicks in, in that, in that moment before the amygdala just takes over. And that's so yeah. beautiful, Kim, because we, we spend so much time at the Institute educating parents and even other professionals about, um, we look at, for instance, Bruce Perry's work on the triune brain and looking at the dealing with the brain stem, then you've got your midbrain, your limbic brain before we deal with the upstairs brain, your cortical brain. And what's so beautiful is sometimes we forget to attend. We, we think about that in terms of kids that we have to physically connect and, and develop relationship, but parents often don't get, remember that they have to, they have to go there too. They have to respond to that, their limbic and their brainstem and ensure that they're, they're nurturing that part of themselves so they can give their kids what they need. It's about co-regulation. You know, yeah. I was, I was really struck um, years and years ago when I was, uh, helping at a conference with Joseph Chilton Pierce, who's one of my favorite people and wrote uh, Transcendent Biology and the Magical Child, beautiful books. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, um, he was a, a, a biologist um, and a psychologist, and he, t he talked about if you take a cell out of a living heart and put it uh, in a solution and look at it under a powerful microscope, mm -hmm. that, that, that cell will beat and it will keep beating after a time, it'll fibrillate and then expire. Now, when that cell is fibrillating, about to expire, and you take a cell from another completely different heart and place it near the fibrillating cell, the beating cell will then start to bring the, the fibrillating cell back into life and the two will beat simultaneously. The synchronicity happens, will, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was synchronicity, and yeah. and they um and will last much much longer than they otherwise would have, and so that kind of co-regulation was a really big part of 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 my work and and this this new book, because it, we are the emotional climate control in our homes. We are the co-regulators. It begins um, with us because our little children, as we know, are you know, they're so helpless. They can't run as fast as an adult. They can't 
you know, just primitively, they can't defend themselves, they can't protect themselves, they can't easily provide for themselves. So what they can do over tens of thousands of years is tune into us. They are really, really good at that because they've had to be to survive. So taking that and all that's held in the mirror neurons in the brain mm -hmm. and taking all that and, and leaning into that and saying, okay, then there has to be a way to very quickly regulate ourselves right on the spot. You know, a child can't be having a meltdown or headed towards a meltdown. And we say to the child, oh, just hold that meltdown for a moment. I'm just going to go and meditate. Oh, yeah. and <laughs> deep, deep breaths while you're screaming in my face. You know, um, yeah. would you mind just holding, holding <laughs> that, that, Can you that imagine? That'd be very handy if they did that, but that's not how things work. Right. So um, but what um, uh, we need to be able to do is right on the spot, right there, when our kids uh, were about to lose it, we're about to go into those old action reaction patterns. Mm -hmm. And we can hear ourselves going there. Do you know that one where you can sense yourself losing Feel it? it. Yeah. And you feel it and you can hear yourself speaking in a voice you don't want to speak in. You just don't want to speak it. That is not the voice you want to be using at all. And you can't stop yourself. You know, you, you, um, what this is about, the compassionate response practice, is that a couple of minutes in the morning, a couple of minutes at night max, for a couple of weeks, starts to develop a way that cuts across that pattern. So right on the spot, your voice comes out. Mm -hmm. What you want to say comes out. And parents have just, you know, the, mm, the feeling of liberation is amazing. And it isn't just with me, because as you know, we have over 1,200 Simplicity Parenting coaches around the world. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And a lot of feedback, a lot from all different countries, a lot of feedback. Every single one of our coaches teaches this, this particular practice. And um, so it's cross-cultural, cross-socioeconomic um, boundaries. This is something that unites us all as parents, as wanting to speak in our own voice not in some stress regress, not in some voice from our biography. And that's what these men to come full circle um, that I worked with who were really stuck in a cycle, that is what they managed to break free of. And that's what thousands and thousands of parents using this practice have um, to a moderate or, or a significant extent broken free of. So when we're able to self-regulate, then our child moves from that emotional fibrillation mm -hmm. back to that co-beating. And that is, what, that is what we're all aiming for, to speak in our own voice, to, to be the parent we want to be. And so that when our child is, is disoriented, we're oriented. I don't necessarily think we need to be calm and, and, and just, uh, you know, all, all that kind of, it's just when our children are disoriented, it's one of the most uncomfortable feelings to be as a human being, to be disoriented like that. I, and when children are disoriented, then they're not being disobedient. They're pinging us. They're sending out behavior. They're like echolocating. Yeah. And, all we need to do is just shift our emotional self. Our eyes soften, our shoulders drop, and they sense that we're, we're safe, that we're a safe harbor, and that they can sail right into our emotions. And that's what we want for our children in that moment when they are in, in stormy seas emotionally. They'll sail towards us and regulate and get it get their sort of little emotions or big emotions in those little bodies back together again much more rapidly. And then what happens is that we start to establish almost like a training is that they know when they're dysregulated, they can return to us mm -hmm. to regulate without words, without much needing to be said, without over, over talking it. If over and over we help them sail into the harbor 
of, of our regulation where the waters are calmer. When outside those walls, that harbor wall, it's bumpy and it's life-threatening. It feels like the boat, their emotional boat is about to tip over. If they sail into the safe, calmer waters of our emotional harbor, they'll seek us out. And that, that's attachment. Mm -hmm. That's connection. Yeah. That's truly what it is. And I think from, uh, now one of my jobs, Kim, is I'm also, other than the ICP, is I train psychologists and registered play therapists. And the work with kids is always easy. That is never, that is not hard work to work with children, whether that's doing art therapy or animal assisted therapy or play therapy. And I, I always recommend this book to my clinicians saying, you need to give the parents a lifeline because how can we expect these kids to make long-term changes if the parent can't keep their own lids on? They can't keep keep themselves regulated, the child will keep coming back to therapy, we need to give the parents an anchor, an anchor point. And what can we give them? Even if it's just one tool, what can we give them? And this is where I wanted to interview about this book, because I think this is a great anchor, even for therapists who work with children, is to work with the parents or caregivers to give them that space um, so they can help co-regulate uh, in the home with their kids. Unless, unless we can do that, everything a lot of the other really great tools um, don't get used well no, and to no. their optimal level. And even if we do, you know, the interesting thing is, Tammy, even if we do blow it, even if we do really get angry and shout occasionally. And we will, we all lose, we all we will, will lose it sometimes. We yeah. will lose it or that harsh look or whatever it is. Then we can use the compassionate response practice, even if we have been practicing it and we blow it, right? Mm -hmm then we can say, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. And, you know, kids, give me a minute. And if they know you're going to come back more regulated, they'll say yes, and have several, mum, you know, like take a few. Yeah. Um, but so you go away, you work on this compassionate response, you work on drawing in and integrating all that stuff, the, 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 the heavy, the, I call this the fevered self, the, the emotional fever. You just bring that on in. You breathe out and let out this brilliant, golden, funny, caring, loving parent. And, and you get yourself regulated and come back to your kids and say, look, that came out wrong, kids. Yeah. What I meant to say was, they're my two key sentences, that came out wrong. What I meant to say was, mm -hmm. and, and even if you do blow it, and you do get angry, you can show them what it's like to actually get yourself back in order mm -hmm. and speak. And to, re what and to repair we, the relationship that we repair. Make, when we and to make the repair and work. make it within 10, 15 minutes, not 10 or 15 years. That's wonderful, Kim. So again, everybody watching, this book is called Being at Your Best When Your Kids Are At Their Worst. And this is Kim Payne interviewing. Kim, sorry for the technical problems today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's always a gift to talk to you. And I'm, I'm so glad you, you're willing to consult with Tani and I. And just your work is very important, especially in the world right now that we're living in. So I would really recommend and also to look at Kim's other books, Simplicity, Parenting, and The Soul of Discipline. Those are just very near and dear to my heart. So thank you so much for this chance, Kim. Oh, it's a pleasure, Tammy. And if people want to uh, go, um, really look at, at the compassionate response, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I did a very quick, simple um, introductory workshop. It's free at simplicityparenting.com. You can see it right there on the homepage. And I have a copy of your audio. You can also purchase the MP3 or MP4 for like $15 from your, and I have that on my computer. <laughs> That's how I learned yeah. this. And Kim also walked me through it over a consult one time. It's, uh, yeah, it's on my desktop as we speak right now. So I have listened to it many times. So I'm a big fan of, of this response and working with parents on this. Great, Tammy. Lovely to speak to you. Thank you so much, Kim. You have a great day and thanks a lot. Bye-bye <laughs> now. Bye.